to Baste. Uh, February was a really short month. I had a quick turnaround on this month's episode, and it's a big one. I'm covering big ag. Um, like I'm finding with many of the subjects I have slated to cover, I kind of have a general idea of what went wrong, and then I start digging in, I start researching, and I find out that it's so much more and so much worse than even I imagined. So uh, I think what we're going to have to do is, is sort of have comprehensive episodes like this, but then have spinoff episodes where we kind of look at different umbrella subjects um, underneath each topic. Um, and that's a good thing. That means more episodes. Um, and the show's doing really well. So thank you all so much for your support so far. We are averaging like 6,000 to 8,000 um, views for every episode that puts us in the top 5% of podcasts. Just as a reminder, I do not pay for any views. I don't pay to promote this on social media. I don't like their policies. I don't like the fact that they can censor you. I don't like the fact that they can just totally shut down your platform with no recourse. So I'm not giving them any money. Um, so this is purely off word of mouth and off of your help. So if you don't mind, please continue to share the YouTube link. Um, you can share the Facebook link on Facebook. And you can rate and review the show in Apple iTunes. That would be super helpful. Um, also, I want to show you something. Based got its first fan art. I just, this made my day. This was from Brian Wooten, who is a graphic designer. Um, if you're listening on audio, I posted this on my Twitter, at HannahCox7, so you can go view it there. Um, so thanks, Brian. That was so exciting for me. Um, and anyways, now that my self-plug is out of the way, we will actually dive into the subject matter. So, what is big ag? I know this is a term that kind of gets thrown a lot around a lot. I think more so on the left, but I think people on the right are maybe familiar with it. Um, it's a it's it's a really big comprehensive issue like I said we're definitely going to have multiple episodes that kind of would fall under this category so today I want to look at what people mean when they say big ag I want to look at how it affects us and I want to of course look at the role that government played in the situation now if you're a city girl like me or at least like me pre-pandemic you might be thinking this doesn't really pertain to you farms aren't very interesting um, you might not be much of an agriculture person, but I promise you this is actually a really interesting subject matter that does impact all of us. So hang with me. I'm going to walk you through it. First of all, despite being the richest country ever, period, ever in the history of the world, America is very, very unhealthy. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. People know that. Uh, among OECD countries, we are actually the most obese. Um, now, some time ago, these two things might have gone together because it used to be a sign of wealth and beauty to be a little bit overweight. And that was because only the aristocrats could afford to have surpluses in food and to sit around and not perform manual labor, which would have burned off the excesses. But in modern times, that has actually reversed itself. And typically, we associate wealthier people, wealthier countries, with being more fit. Um, these are people who have the luxury of uh, of working out or going to the gym. They can usually afford to pay higher prices for their food. They might have better access to better grocery stores, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's, this association has flipped. Um, in a 2010 article, American Express actually compared losing weight to getting one's finances under control, pointing out that they both require impulse control, which I thought was interesting. Um, and they were examining the ties between larger bank accounts and slimmer waistlines. So this is increasingly um, something where you would expect to see a different circumstance in the United States based on our wealth that is not coming about. So if we are so wealthy, why are we so unwell? Uh, it appears that our weight is actually just an outward sign of a very sick society. One person dies every 36 seconds due to heart disease. It's actually the leading cause of death across all genders and races, which is not the kind of thing that we want to unite us. Um, we spend about $219 billion on this disease every year, and it's by no means our only problem. We also have 1 in 10 Americans that have diabetes, and the CDC says that 90 to 95 percent of those are type 2 diabetes, which is the kind that's brought on by lifestyle choices. Um, and we aren't just unwell physically. Our mental health is not doing so hot either. In 2019, one in five Americans reported struggling with mental illness, and that's a number we can only imagine has shot up during the lockdowns. So, we're wealthy, we're super unwell, what's up? Well, those on the left will often point to our healthcare system, and I do think that system deserves plenty of criticism. But we spend more on healthcare than comparative countries and still have worse results, lower life expectancies. Now, many on the right will point to the role of personal choices. And that's fair. Um, a study finds that only 3% of our population meets these four basic health criteria. Non-smoking, uh, a healthy diet that scores above 40% on the Healthy Eating Index, a 
healthy body fat percentage and working out about 150 minutes a week. So most people aren't meeting those very basic criteria. Um, but what if there's a deeper problem? One that inhibits people from successfully leading a healthy lifestyle even when they're trying to? One that makes people sick and overburdens our healthcare system? I think there is, and I think that that actually traces back to our food. Uh, to be clear, humanity has always faced problems with food. There's this perception nowadays that like we're unique in having these issues around what we consume, but we're not. Historically, food has always been a scarce commodity. Um, it's one that can be expensive and time consuming or even impossible to obtain based on drought, war, environmental factors, communism. There's a lot of things that have prevented people from getting the food that they need over the past centuries. Um, encouragingly, the war on hunger is one of the few that we're actually kind of winning, and we're doing it pretty rapidly. We're making a lot of gains. Uh, according to data from the United Nations, as recently as 1992, over a quarter of the world's population was undernourished. But despite population growth, that number fell 28% by 2015. Uh, the amount of food produced per person is now 20% greater than it was in 2005. That's a massive jump in a very short window. Uh, and in 2005, it was almost double what had been in 1961. So this is increasing rapidly, our ability to feed the world population. And that's spectacular. It's really encouraging. Um, it's, if you want some optimistic news, I encourage you to go look at the Cato Institute's Human Progress Project that reports on a lot of this data globally. It's actually very encouraging to read. And what you will tend to see is that as a region of the, of the world um, begins to expand free market capitalism, we see the rates of hunger diminish quite quickly in those places. So definitely give them a follow. Um, an important economic point within these de developments is that food supply has risen, and so the costs have fallen. Um, today, the cost of food is less than half of what it was back in 1900. So more of it, and it's cheaper. Just a, re a reminder, back in previous episodes, we've talked about the laws of supply and demand and how they basically determine what the prices should actually be on a free market. Um, this is just another example of that. Um, and so when you see supply increase, costs will go down. That's true in any, any product, any market. Um, there's still definitely work to be done when it comes to addressing world hunger. By no means is our work finished. Even in this country, we still have issues with hunger. But it is important to note the gains that we have made um, and that we are combating that really, really serious pro uh, problem globally and in our country. But the question remains, at what cost and whose expense? Um, per usual, to really see the full picture, we have to scroll back in time. So this is a brief history of agriculture in the U.S. Prior to the 1900s, food was local. Many families grew their own gardens, and most Americans actually lived rurally, 90% of them on farms specifically. Machinery was still a few decades away, and so you really saw farmers that were maintaining pretty small uh, plots of land. Each farmer grew enough food to feed three to five people per year. So they were mostly feeding their family, maybe a couple neighbors. Uh, in the late 1800s, states and the federal government started giving public land to railroad companies to incentivize them to build their tracks in remote areas and help settle the country. Cronyism. Every time. Uh, once the railroads were complete, these companies and the government went about convincing people to move to the heartland. And they uh, did this through a period of time known as the settlement years, and there were four major laws that really helped them achieve this. It made land available to settlers for free or for very cheap. Um, and those laws were the Preemption Act of 1841, the Homestead Act of 1862, the Timber Culture Act of 1873, and the Kincaid Act of 1904. Uh, in 1862, you see the U.S. Department of Agriculture established, and so you have this whole period of settlement, and that kind of wraps up by about 1890. Um, and then from the 1890s through sort of the early teens of the 1900s, you see that farming and government are starting to hook up. It's happening slowly, it's kind of under the surface, but it's moving. Um, you see in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt passes the Food and Drug Act. And this was um, supposed to be like a consumer protection in the food industry. It was largely spurred on by the public's reaction to a book you probably read in school. I know I did, and it was rather gross, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Um, so you have this like sort of huge fear mongering around factories and machinery. It's all very new to people, and they're scared, and they want regulations. They're crying out for the government to protect them, which is always the first step in anybody's downfall. They're not going to protect you. Um, so you get that act passed. Then you have the Meat Inspection Act that follows in 1907. And agriculture is just increasingly becoming more and more linked with government through both regulation and through crony practices, where the government's really seeking to centrally plan the country. And it kind of works for a very short time period. You really see this like boom period in farming from 1910 to 1914. 
Now there were other factors going on that explain this. There was a world a world war, World War One. So hard to say. World War One was going on. Now America stayed out of World War One until 1917. And so you have these early teen years where a lot of the European farmers are all fighting wars, they're not producing crops, and so demand skyrockets. What happens when demand skyrockets? Prices go up. So farmers are making really good money during this time and they're loving it. They're like, this is great, we're making so much money, we all have this free land. Like, of course they're having a pretty good time. This is this is a good setup for them. Um, government then gets even more involved in agriculture and passes what's called the Federal Farm Loan Act of 1916. And this basically creates cooperative banks to provide loans to farmers uh, called federal loan banks. So from 1916 on, this is like pretty clearly no longer a free market operation. This is a government operation, taxpayer funded. Uh, we are basically giving the money to farmers up front to pay for their crops, to pay for their seeds, and then when they make their profit, once they produce the actual crops, then they pay it back. Um, we start getting involved with the insurance for crops. If they aren't able to turn a profit, all of these things start getting really inextricably linked during this time. Um, after the war ends, the farmers start to see a slump in their profits because there's no longer this huge demand from Europe. And they use this time period to argue for what's called the doctrine of parity. Basically, the farmers say that farming should be as profitable as it was during the boom period. You know, they want their money and they want the federal government to make sure that they get their money through price controls. Never a good idea. Price controls are always bad, always bad. I don't know why we're still having to tell people this. Like, point to one time in history price controls worked. I can't. I cannot. And yet we keep trying. Um, now, the first attempt to pass this fails in the 1920s because Calvin Coolidge is president, and there's still an ounce of sanity and, like, basic economic literacy in the country. So he vetoes that. But then comes the Great Depression. Prices for farm commodities were already slumping down the 20s. The Great Depression just accelerates that. It bottoms out. It's really bad. People are starving. We can't figure out how to feed our people. Farmers are going belly up. Um, farmers are unable to pay their expenses and their loan payments that we've been giving them back. They start walking away from their farms. They leave those federal loan banks with numerous defaults. And by 1933, nearly one half of the National Farm Loan Associations were failing and farm foreclosures were common. Now, it's important to note who is now in the White House at this period. It's FDR. Warned you, told you, every time something goes bad in this country, just start tracing it back. And you're probably going to end up at FDR's White House because he was a monster of bad ideas. Um, so it's about to go south. In 1933, FDR passes the New Deal, probably the greatest um, catastrophe in American history as far as public policy goes. One program under this legislation is the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, and this plan seeks to restore agricultural prosperity during the Great Depression by curtailing farm production, reducing export surpluses, and raising prices. So basically, it was an omnibus farm relief bill, and it carried out the crony interests of the major national farm organizations. Uh, it created a domestic allotment plan that would subsidize producers of basic commodities for cutting their output. Its goal was the restoration of prices paid to farmers for their goods at an equal level of that from 1909 to 1914. So they get their parity, basically. Um, and what that means is that farmers got to reduce their supply, how much they were making of their crops, um, so that the prices could artificially be increased, because when you cut supply, prices go up. Um, and then, to make up for that loss in profits that the farmers would get from selling that output, the government starts subsidizing them. I know, it makes literally no sense. Cronyism never does. I swear a baboon could be better at managing the economic system than most of these politicians. Like, it's just asinine. But that's what happens. And so that begins what I will refer to as big ag in America. What we have today is a food system that is overrun with cronyism. And if that's a new term to you, what I mean by cronyism is a situation where the government partners with big corporations, unions, or other national type organizations or industries to basically pervert the free market. Um, such an arrangement is always going to benefit the politicians and the government and, and people in office who are getting usually some kind of donations or PAC funding from these organizations. And it's going to benefit those few connected industries or corporations because basically they're partnering with the government to cut out their competition, um, to put in place protectionism, things that will help them keep their prices artificially high. Who it hurts is all of us and all the other small businesses, which I will remind you, that make up the majority of businesses in this country. So often when we talk about business policies in this country, everybody wants to picture corporations. The vast majority of businesses in this country are small businesses. The vast majority of people are employed by a small business. And these people get really, really hurt when we start looking at crony policies. So what does that look like in this context? I want to give you some examples. 
Uh, beginning in the 1980s, the U.S. government issued misinformation to consumers that told them fats were unhealthy for them. At the same time, a committee at the Food and Drug Administration, they awarded sugar generally recognized as safe status, even for diabetics, even for diabetics, despite internal dissent from the USDA's Carbohydrate Nutrition Laboratory and just basic common sense. Come on. As a result, Americans' consumption of carbs increased 57 grams per person, and from 1980, the global prevalence of diabetes rose from 4.7% to 8.5% by 2014, so it doubled. It doubled. Um, it's common knowledge by now that this is laughably bad advice. So why would they do this? In short, it's because the sugar lobby had become that powerful, um, and, and if you look at who's making these decisions, who's issuing this information, it's unelected government bureaucracies um, and agencies, and they're just corrupt. Um, so basically, the sugar lobby paid people to say that fats were bad and sugar was fine, and the government then acted as their mouthpiece and told everybody that that was true and backed it up. And it screwed people, and it's still continuing to impact people. Um, in the United States, fewer than 4,500 farm businesses produce sugar. Yet they cost taxpayers up to $4 billion a year in subsidies. Market Watch says the U.S. sugar problem is a Stalinist-style supply control initiative that limits imports through quotas and domestic production through what are called marketing allotments. This strategy substantially increases U.S. prices. On average, U.S. sugar prices are about twice as high as world prices, ensuring domestic sugar production is artificially higher and crowding out alternatives. Um, only this shrinking group of those that are raising sugar beets and cane sugar benefit from this program. And they receive, on average, over 700000 per grower each year, according to analysis by the American Enterprise Institute. These recipients depend on the U.S. Sugar Alliance, which is their big lobbying arm, and they come in and they work to maintain a highly protectionist, trade-distorting program that costs a family for between $44 and nearly $50 a year in subsidies. This is a good place to point out the importance of free trade. Um, when we say protectionism, what we usually mean is when the government uses trade to hinder the free market and basically rig the system to keep prices artificially high to prevent American consumers from accessing goods being made in other places. Free trade is important. Both major parties have turned their backs on it in recent decades, and it's very stupid. It's very easily provable. It's just very, very basic um, when it comes to the idea of a free market, that you should be able to trade and buy and sell with whomever you please to get the best price and the best product for yourself. They are preventing consumers from accessing that when they are, when they are manipulating trade. So, the sugar lobby keeps their prices artificially high through government manipulation of the market and subsidizes a product that people do not need or want. Uh, in a free market, it's, it's certain that healthier alternatives would have encroached on if not replaced sugar's prominence, especially as we've entered into the age of information and the average person is learning just how damaging sugar is, how addicting it is, how problematic it is for our health. Um, but it's not happening because of this government manipulation in the market that's blocking us from better products and forcing us to subsidize those that we don't want. So because of these policies, we now have a sugar surplus and something has to be done with it. And that's where the other side of the manipulation comes in under big ag. In the 1960s, the sugar industry funded research that downplayed the risk of sugar and highlighted the hazards of fat, which is a reminder that scientists can pretty easily be bought. It's a good thing to keep in mind these days. According to NPR, an industry group called the Sugar Research Foundation wanted to refute concerns about sugar's possible role in heart disease. They then sponsored research by Harvard scientists that did just that. The result was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1967 with no disclosure of the sugar industry's funding. We of course know all this is utter junk. Sugar is a far more damaging substance than fat, um, and the government basically takes this science and starts acting as a mouthpiece and kind of telling consumers to look away um, from anybody that's pushing back on this at the time, and has continued to really do that for many, many decades. Um, and this data starts to really shape our food industry for decades because companies start rushing to remove fats. They're advertising fat-free, fat-free. Um, meanwhile, they're relying on sugar to enhance the flavor that is being removed when they take the fat out. And so you have all these people for decades that are buying fat-free food, and they think, why am I gaining weight? Why am I not losing weight? Because they're being mismarketed to. They're being intentionally misled, and they're being stuffed with sugar, which is making them fatter and unhealthier consistently over those decades. Even nowadays, 
Um, I think this has become more common knowledge what they did with fats and sugar. There's been a really good documentary called Fed Up that's out there that's about it if you'd like more information. But this is still going on, and people have got to learn to do their research, to pay attention to labels. I tend to eat a keto diet or at least a very low-carb diet. Um, when you're eating keto, that means you're well under 30 grams of carbs a day. It's very low carbs. Even now, when I'm shopping the grocery store, I'll see like keto on a product, and I'll turn it over and I'll look at the label, and it will say like 50 grams of carbs for you know a granola bar. It's not keto, but so many people see keto and they buy it and they eat it and they think, why am I not losing weight? Why is my diet not working? Well, because it's it's bull. The advertising is bull. So you've got to take some self responsibility. Quit relying on the government. Quit relying on these companies to tell you what's healthy and do your research. I mean, there is an element of self responsibility there, but I also do feel really bad for people who feel like they're trying to do um the right thing, they're trying to diet, they're trying to get their life under control, and they can't because they're being lied to. So that's that's just a personal issue I have with it. Um, and it doesn't end there. So not that I'm in favor of government being involved in this industry at all. I'm not. Like I just said, do your own research. Um, but while Americans are currently told to fill 50% of their place with fruits and vegetables in the U.S., um, we spend less than 1% of farm subsidies supporting the research, production, and marketing of fruits and vegetables, which does make a difference because the reality is most people do listen to government. Um, what we do spend our money on, well, it goes to soy, corn, rice, and wheat predominantly, um, all of which can be converted into cheap, highly processed foods, which make up the bulk of your grocery stores, which make up the bulk of your restaurants, carbs, sugar, everywhere you look. Um, and then the rest goes mostly to sorghum, dairy, and livestock. Um, and together, those seven commodities receive $170 billion between 1995 and 2010. That number's surely much higher now. Uh, even more damning, researchers have found a higher probability of both obesity and unhealthy blood glucose levels, which raises the risk of type 2 diabetes, among people who consume the most calories from subsidized foods. So it's directly linked. Uh, when you inflate supply, these products will obviously be easier and cheaper to come by. Um, and the reality of this is visible, as I pointed out, throughout our whole food industry. Processed foods take up 75% of our stores, while fresh produce and meat are kind of pushed to the margins. Fast food restaurants litter our street corners, while you can barely find a place to get a fresh salad. Um, and all of this stands, even as Americans really desire better options, we see that 93% claim they wish they could eat healthier. Um, only 28% can consistently access healthy food. And one in three were never educated on healthy choices. In a free market, this would start to change. There's only one explanation for why the market is not meeting consumers' demands, needs, and wishes. And that's because government is manipulating the situation. Uh, instead of getting the healthier, healthier options we see, consumers are force-fed all of this crap that big government subsidizes. Um, another example is corn. The U.S. leads the world in corn production. But corn is not all that great, and it's certainly not good for you. So what happens? They turn it into high-fructose corn syrup and use it to replace sugar, which is a more expensive product, which is a more expensive product because of their manipulation in the market. Uh, today, the average American eats 41.5 pounds of high-fructose corn syrup a year which is financed by U.S. corn subsidies. That's gross. That's in addition to the 29 pounds of traditional sugar the USDA reports that we eat. Wheat, rice, and soy are also turned into similarly processed food products. So we're getting an overabundance in our diet without even really wanting to or always even knowing it. If you start looking at the products that you're eating that are processed, you will see wheat, corn, soy, lead in all these categories. Just start looking at your labels a bit more closely and you'll, you'll start to quickly recognize that an overabundance of our diet is being made up by these products. Um, let's not forget about dairy too. Anyone remember the Got Milk campaign in the 1990s? Because I do. I got force-fed milk my entire childhood. I was told it was going to make my bones strong. I was told I needed to drink it to be healthy. All of my favorite celebrities were in the ad campaign. They used the Olsen twins against us. Like, I would never have suspected. It was just, it was so corrupt. Um, and why did they do that? It was because milk consumption was at its lowest point in decades because consumers don't like, want, or need it. Um, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture stepped in and advised that Americans start drinking three glasses a day. It's a lot of milk. Never mind that one in four Americans can't even process the stuff because it's not normal to drink another mammal's milk. Uh, never mind that it can actually lead to cancer. They branded it as the must-have health drink, and they started marketing the crap out of it to consumers. Um, government got together with a bunch of industry insiders and marketers. They sat down in a room, and they figured out the Got Milk campaign, basically to trick the American public into drinking milk. And it was all bull. It was bull the whole time. 
They've done the same thing with cheese. You ever wonder why cheese is marketed? It's on everything. It's sold. It's talked about everywhere you go. Cheese. Add cheese. Well, there's a reason for that, and it goes back to our dairy subsidies that have created a 1.4 billion pound surplus of cheese in this country that we have no idea what to do with. So we're just consistently marketing it and pushing it on people. Ugh, it's very, very frustrating. Once you start to see how it all connects, you'll never look at menus the same. You'll just be furious every time you go to eat. Uh, government subsidies make these foods very, very cheap, much cheaper than unsubsidized raw produce, fish, or meat. Again, they're inflating the supply for products. They have a decreasing demand that's going to bring the price down. Naturally, Americans respond to these low prices and buy in bulk. Today, 23% of Americans' grocery budgets go into processed foods and sweets compared to 12% in 1982. So it's, I often hear people say, like, why is it so much ex more expensive to eat healthy? It is more expensive to eat healthy because we're not subsidizing those products. Um, the reason these products are so cheap is because of the government subsidies. So you're paying for it one way or another. Like, you don't really get a choice in that. Um, so throughout the decades, government has been working with these crony industries to subsidize production, inflate supply, uh, and then market that consumption of these products, inflate demand, under false pretenses to the general unsuspecting public, making everyone unhealthy and overweight. Not only does the government issue misleading information, force taxpayers to subsidize products they don't want, and use public funds to market those same products back to them, they also block competing narratives. First, they do that by elevating themselves in their agencies. You have things like the USDA, the FDA, the Department of Agriculture, and the Food Safety Inspection Service. And they communicate through their guidance that, that their information supersedes others, even though these agencies have been consistently wrong and should never be listened to. Uh, but people and parents naively trust them. They follow their directives. They send their schools off to public schools to eat their public lunches where the federal government has literally classified pizza as a vegetable because it has tomato sauce on it. And this is just an overarching point that I hope everybody takes away from the show. Quit trusting the government. They're not here for you. They are never going to take care of you. They are never going to have your best interest at heart. This is why we need a limited government. These aren't your friends. Wake up. Um, on top of these, uh, on top of these like initiatives and messaging campaigns that they take on, the government also heavily licenses nutritionists. Every episode, every episode, I tell you to watch them on occupational licensing. Watch them, watch them. Every episode, I'll bring it up because it always ties in. They use these licenses to heavily control what these professionals can do and say. And in many states, it actually prevents nutritionists from giving more holistic advice that would uh, be counterintuitive to the government's narrative. And then there are other repercussions as well. Uh, farmland is not used for better, healthier products. Essentially, the free market is restricted and consumers' desires and needs are not going to be met because we have this like huge wrench thrown into the market by government subsidies. Um, and on top of all of this, it also hurts the cute little American farmer that we all picture when we talk about agriculture, I think. It's very ingrained. It's very much a part of the American dream. Um, and, and it's important to remember that the vast majority of these farmers, they don't receive subsidies. We see that 50 people on the Forbes 400 list of the wealthiest Americans received farm subsidies recently, but on the other hand, 62% of U.S. farms do not receive anything. In 2015, more than half the value of United States farm production came from farms with at least $1 million in sales, compared to 31% in 1991. Big Ag is literally like a weed that's growing up and choking out the roots of their smaller farmer competition. Uh, and in fact, as I told you, what usually happens when you have these crony arrangements is this ends up hurting the small farmers in the market more than anyone else. Essentially, we're taking their tax dollars and giving it to their competitors who are much bigger and have the government in their pocket. It's so corrupt. Crony it's, cronyism is, is often in these kind of corporate welfare arrangements, and they're just, it's really, really problematic. It's something everybody should care about, but certainly people who support capitalism should care about it because this is something that's totally antithetical to our views. Um, the government also partners with a select number of companies like Monsanto. I know, I know you guys are waiting for me to bring up Monsanto in this episode. Uh, Monsanto works with government to pass regulations and policies that benefit them to the detriment of small farmers and consumers. And they're not the only one, but they're the most notable and recognizable that do this. Uh, an example of that is Monsanto leads the charge in patented plant varieties, meaning they can take any one who uses their seeds without permission to court, and they frequently do. Farmers have paid Monsanto an estimated 85 to 160 million, and the company devotes 10 million of its annual budget to investigate approximately 500 farmers each year who are suspected of patent infringement. 
it's it's actually really troubling when you dig into Monsanto's predatory um, policies and how they literally stalk these farmers. They incentivize their neighbors to rat on each other. They will go after farmers who have seeds that accidentally grow the next year if they haven't re-upped their um, deal with them. It's, it's just very, very depressing when you really dig into this company um, and some of the ways that they treat the small farmers. Monsanto also imposes contracts and wields patents that forbid farmers from saving seeds year to year, a practice that has been part of agriculture for centuries. They demand that farmers buy new expensive seeds each year, and if a farmer stops using Monsanto's patented seeds, they're at risk of breaching their contract because sprouts from patented seeds can accidentally bloom a year later. Um, it's called a volunteer seed. They can grow spontaneously, um, even if there's a new seed planted, and Monsanto will still go after those people and prosecute them a lot of the time. Um, Monsanto tells the safety of their products and claims to support worker safety. Um, but their products uh, have actually overseas been held liable for um, actually having severe um, ramifications on farmers' health. Uh, but in the country, in the, in the U.S., they have, farmers have had very few recourse for actually trying to prove that. Um, we will do a whole episode on Monsanto. I promise you that. It's something I care about a lot. Um, if you don't know this about me, my family is actually from the Anniston-Oxford area of Alabama, and we now live in Anderson, South Carolina, which are two of the places Monsanto happens to have poisoned. So I know a lot about Monsanto. I have serious issues with it. Cannot possibly squeeze that all into one episode, but we will circle back on those guys because I hate them. Um, so I'm tipping my hat here. I promise you. We'll be back. Uh, in conclusion, big ag, these policies, this type of industry, is an enemy of the people. And we need to all start digging into the backgrounds of our state and federal lawmakers. See who's paying them, pay attention to who's got them on their payroll, look at how they're voting on these things because they're making us sick. Physically and mentally, studies have shown that unhealthy diets affect the brain as well as the body. Diets high in saturated fats and refined carbohydrates are associated with greater incidence of depression, depressive symptoms, and anxiety. In older adults, an unhealthy diet is associated with a smaller left hippocampus, which controls learning, memory, and mood regulation. So this isn't just, you know, heart disease and diabetes. That's a big part of it, but it actually has an implication on our whole health system at large. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it has, a, it has an implication on all these people who are trying to diet, who are really working hard and just getting totally screwed over in this process. Um, and, you know, this hits close to home for me. I have family members who are diabetic. I watch them try to fix their diet. I watch them try to deal with the effects of being addicted to sugar because it's been pumped into their diet for so many decades. And it's just very, very sad. It's hard to watch. Um, and, and there really is some serious political responsibility in this picture. When you start to really trace the problems afflicting so much of our society back, an overwhelming number of them do go back to our food supply. And we haven't even scratched the surface here, guys. I told you, this is a big topic. I want to do future episodes not just on Monsanto, but on some of the free speech um, regulations, ways that they prohibit people from marketing their products. That's a really, really key component. I want to talk about what's allowed in our food and what isn't and how that came to be. Um, and I want to talk about our restaurant industry. There's so much to cover under the food issue. I promise this is something we'll circle back to from time to time. Um, but for now, if you like this episode, again, please help me share it. I really appreciate your support, and I will see you again next month.